This is Michelle Hughes from Ageless and Timeless. Today's podcast is brought to you by Water and Wellness. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit Water and Wellness at their offices, and I can tell you that as far as you and I are concerned and our health is concerned, this is one of the most important places that you can go to find water that is purified and products that will help your longevity and your overall health. Visit waterandwellness.com to learn how you can take control of your drinking water and learn about those natural additives to optimize your health and longevity. Contact Stacy at 877-296-6880. Use the Ageless code and you'll get a 20% discount on all your products. My love for you is immeasurable. My respect for you demands your ageless, timeless, lace and fineness, your beauty and elegance. Francisco, and my guest today is Benjamin Hardy, a PhD and an organizational psychologist. And he's, I believe, coming to us from Orlando, Florida. Is that correct, Ben? Yep. Hanging out in Florida. How's the weather down there? It's pretty great. Yeah, it's uh, know, it's mild. You know, it's 80 degrees or something like that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Well, it's actually been very warm here in, in uh, Northern Cal, too. We've had 75-degree weather. So, well, it, I want to introduce you, Ben, because I've been reading your blog for about a year now, I believe. And um, I learned so much from you and I want you to know that you're so aligned with our um, ageless and timeless theme. So today we'll be talking really about a lot of the concepts that you define both in your blogs and also in your upcoming book launch, uh, a book that is now is called Personality Isn't Permanent. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background? I, I read your bio and I'm like overwhelmed by the fact that you have five children all in one year. That's something you need to explain. And how do you manage that personal and the business uh, balance in your life? So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about who you are, how you've come to this place of being a teacher, a coach, and um, really a, a thought leader in the world today. So it, it's all yours, Ben. Sounds amazing. Well, I'm grateful that uh, you've enjoyed the blogs and you've gotten something out of them. That's amazing. Yeah, so basically during the first year of my PhD program at Clemson, my wife and I became foster parents of three kids all at once, three siblings. And the reason we did it was because my wife wanted to be a foster parent. She had grown up with foster girls in her home and it was just something she'd always wanted to do. It was not really on my radar. And so, yeah, we, she wanted to do it. And so we, we, we went for it during the first year of my PhD program. And she was also a first year graduate student as well. So that was quite shocking, quite amazing, quite crazy as far as taking in three kids from a very intense background with a lot of emotional needs and yeah, it was transformational. It's, it, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done, and it's changed my perspective on a lot of different things. Um, it was actually the reason I wrote Willpower Doesn't Work, is because I watched what happens when you take some kids from a very limiting environment where there's no options, no choices, you know, their parents are totally neglectful, and you put them into an environment where they've got a little bit more options. You know, they've got parents who will give them warm meals and put them mm -hmm. to bed and put them through routines. And expose them to new things. One of the things that we did during the first year we had our kids was we, we took them to like 30 different states in the United States just to show them new things because they had only traveled like within 10 or 20 miles of their house in their rural, you know, out in rural South Carolina. So they hadn't seen anything. And so their views were, it was, so it's just amazing to watch the change that happens to, to them. And also the change obviously that happens to me and my wife when you know, you go from focusing almost all of your time on yourself to having to deal with these kids and, and learning from them and, and, uh, and 
having to learn how to make them a purpose rather than just trying to avoid them and having to learn how to love them and support them and make them a big aspect of your identity and your goals. So it, it was an amazing transformational experience. Uh, we ended up fighting the foster system for three years. I actually started blogging online right around that time, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. right, right around early 2015. And so it was all kind of happening at the same time. Over the next three years, we fought the foster system, you know, in court and eventually the laws in South Carolina changed and out of the blue or just suddenly we were able to adopt our kids. And then, yeah, my wife got pregnant a month later, as is often cliche. And we had twin girls later that year. So in 2018, we had, we had, um, you know, five kids essentially. And it was the, it was the same year that I launched willpower doesn't work, which was crazy and traumatic. And at that point I'd become the top writer in the world on medium.com and was blogging like crazy and just, having a, a blast with writing and sharing my ideas. And, and mm. now here we are, you know, I, I feel like I'm even a different person than the person who wrote Will, willpower doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, uh, I really love the quote from Elaine de Button, you know, anyone who isn't embarrassed by, by who they were 12 months ago, hasn't learned enough. Right. And, uh, I feel like I've gone through so much since I wrote willpower doesn't work. Um, that sometimes going back and even reading it and listening to it, it feels like I'm reading the words of someone else because I've gone through so much, even since like two or three years ago when I wrote that book. And so it's just been an interesting, crazy ride. And now I'm just uh, taking the experiences I've learned and striving for better goals and doing things hopefully better than I did before. And hopefully my future self is better than my current self. <laughs> so it's, a, it's just a fun journey. Well, I think that's a, a, an amazing um, perceptive quote to uh, our viewers because many people get stuck in their lives and the, the past is the present for them. They, they are not finding those new challenges, new adventures, new goals. And so why don't you talk for a moment about how people who are in an inertia state or stuck can extricate themselves from that ennui, the boredom of, of life as, as it always was and not life as it is today or can be tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start by sharing a little bit of really interesting research that's kind of been developing in psychology for the last five or 10 years. So Dr. Daniel Gilbert, he's a Harvard psychologist. He's been studying personal development or sorry, personality change over time. Uh, and one of the things that he's found, and you know, you could even think about this yourself as, as the listener, but also, you know, you could think about this as well is, you know, were you a, were you different from who you are right now as far as 10 years ago? Like, think about who you were 10 years ago. Think about the things that were interesting to you. Think about your goals. Think about how you saw the world. Think about what you were striving for. Think about your relationships, your habits, your perspectives. Would you say that you've changed a little bit in the last 10 years? Mm, that's such a good question. Well, I look at, for me personally, I look at life as an ever-changing adventure and that every day offers a new <laughs> opportunity to grow and to learn. And if we're, as you said, in, well, somebody said in one of the quotes, if we stop learning, we die. So, so would you, you say know, you're pretty different than you were 10? Would, would you say you're pretty different than you were 10 years ago then? Yes. Yeah, so the answer is absolutely yes. And, and there's so much to the answer to qualify that answer but yes the answer is absolutely a hundred percent yes so that's i couldn't agree more so one of the key things right here is is realizing that your current self and your former self actually are two different people mm -hmm. um you're not the same person you were before and there's probably a lot of things that you don't identify with that you used to identify with and so mm -hmm. your identity is different uh, what dr gilbert does after he has people think about who they were 10 years ago is he then asks them the question, who do you think you're going to be in 10 years from now? Or do you mm -hmm. think that you are going to make as much change in the next 10 years as you have in the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. And what he generally finds is that people, even though they have realized that they've made big change in the last 10 years, they often downplay the change that they think will happen in the next 10 years. Uh, because we assume that who we are is pretty much the evolved version of ourselves. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and we've kind of overly attached with our current viewpoint and our current identity and our current labels. And so what Dr. Gilbert said is, is that human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished. Another thing he says is that it's, it's a lot easier to remember the past than to imagine the future. And so mm -hmm. what we do is, is we don't imagine the future. And so nowadays, there's a lot of really cool research on the psychology of like a future you, that your, your future self. And mm -hmm. 
in order to begin living intentionally and beginning to have more powerful learning experiences, you've got to really start thinking about who your future self is. Who is that person you genuinely want to be? If you, you know, it, it, the only way to be authentic as a person is to own fully what you truly want and then to define and describe that to other people. Uh, there's a lot of fear and courage in that. And a lot of people are afraid to admit what they really want because of either the opinions of other people or because, you know, if they fail, then they're a fraud. There's like all these fears that limit their, their decision-making, but the, the best thing you can do in order to live an intentional life and to begin evolving and, and growing more fast, as, you know, faster as a person is to define who you want to be and to use that as the basis of your identity. Um, because as people, we shape our identity by our by our narrative and by our story. And if your narrative and your identity is based on the future self that you genuinely want to become, and obviously what the researchers show, and I agree with this, is, is that it's really nice to define your future self as a different person than your current self, because they are different. You're going to, they're going to see the world differently than you. They have different goals than you have, a different environment, different situation, different habits, different characteristics. And so it's better to make decisions based on what your future self, which is a different person would want, rather than overly thinking that your current self is who you truly are. Uh, and in order to do that, you've got to develop some form of what's called psychological flexibility. You've got to be flexible and you've got to not overly and dogmatically think that the current you is the, is the true you and is the only you. Uh, I like what Stephen Covey said. He said, we don't see the world as it is, but as we are. So I think that's a starting point. There's lots of other things that you can do to get out of the inertia, but the first step to beginning to stop living on autopilot, which is subconscious, you know, like your, your subconscious is you on autopilot. The first st step to not just living in repeat autopilot mode is, is to start to intentionally think about who you want to be and then to make that the story you begin to tell other people and to start telling people. And that takes a little courage, but to start telling in fact, everyone, that that's what you want and that's who you're going to become. I think that's the first step. Mm -hmm. So that's really like the law of attraction, um, the principle of, of visualization, right? If you start visualizing yourself as that person that you want to be, and you do that in graphic um, terms that miracles can happen, is that is that what you're really saying? That, that's that one way of describing it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, have you ever heard of the concept of deliberate practice? Mm -mm. So deliberate practice is basically, if you study this, you know, high performance psychology, if you study, basically, there's a huge literature on, on what's required to become an expert or world class at anything, let's just say an Olympian or a professional musician. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the, the 10,000 hour rule. Mm, absolutely. So that's I practice, that, that, I practice so, that every day. Well, so the 10,000 hour rule that was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, it, it comes from the research on deliberate practice. And what deliberate practice is, is it's basically, it's, it's the type of training and learning that leads to change. So the opposite of deliberate practice is, let's just say, let's just say you go to the gym every day, but you don't have a specific goal and you're just kind of in a routine. You just do the same routine every day you're, you're do, going to the gym, but you're not actually getting any better. And in fact, you're actually probably getting worse and you're just mm -hmm. kind of going through the motions. And that's, um, and so deliberate practice would be that you have a specific goal and your exercise is targeted toward getting that goal. And you're actually, you're probably, and it has to be very difficult, challenging. Uh, you're probably gonna need like coaching and support and like it, you're, you have to be training and doing something with a purpose. Mm. And, and so, and that's, and, and in order to, become really great at something you've got to do that for a long period of time <laughs> mm -hmm. um and you see and what they what the research shows is that it's actually impossible to engage in that type of development and that type of learning and training or practice whatever it may be it doesn't have to be fitness it could be anything it could be you as a podcaster you have to have a vision or or uh, a visualization of of your future self with the attributes or the situation or the characteristics that you're striving to practice you have mm -hmm. to have a goal in mind in order to practice deliberately or intentionally. It's, it's impossible to have the motivation or the ability to train through that and become whoever you want to be without a clearly defined goal. Mm -hmm. And so you can call it law of attraction if you want, but, and I'm fine with that. Cause I, I think that, you know, but you have, but the point here is being intentional. It's about being clear on what you want on, on being explicit about what you want and then using the, the goal or the target or the outcome as the thing that shapes your process. 
Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people just start with process, but it's far more powerful to start with the end result and then use that result to shape how you go about that process. Um, because the clearer you are on the outcome, the more motivated you'll be and the more, the more targeted your, your process and practice will be. So Ben, how do you guide people to overcome their fears and their insecurities about their stating exactly what it is that they want, but yet being fearful or, or lacking in confidence to uh, get to that place of deliberate practice? What, what is it? What are there any secrets? Are there any magic tools for people to transcend? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, I, I think that the first one is daily journaling. Journaling is really big on like writing out again, like writing regularly the narrative of who you want to be and writing specifically about what you want to do. I mean, you could talk about this in the form of affirmations, but I think it's it's more than that. I think if you're writing specifically like in the morning and evening, and if you're writing, I, I prefer writing in the morning. And if you're writing in specific environments, you can get ideas and, and, and uh, clarity and you can remind yourself. I mean, it's impossible to live intentionally on a daily basis without reminding yourself daily about what you need to do and what you want to accomplish. And so mm -hmm. I would say first thing in the morning, rather than being reactive and on autopilot and uh, you know, looking at your smartphone or doing what you did yesterday and eating the same foods and just not actually being conscious, you want to put yourself in a state where you can actually think genuinely about what you want. Re-remind yourself of that future self. Think about what you want to do and what you need to do that day. Um, and you can't become your future, you know, future self if it's something meaningful in a single day. But if you're taking steps towards that, what happens? Yes, it, yes, it's fear. Yes, it's anxiety. Um, and yes, you don't have the current confidence. That's why your future self isn't you, is because your confidence isn't yet, or nor nor is your capability or your identity. You're not there yet, and your subconscious is at your current level, and your vision of your future self is up here, and so you need to start acting like your future self, taking steps forward. That's actually how you build confidence is you mm -hmm. take steps in the direction of your goal. And sometimes you'll fail. Sometimes you'll learn. Sometimes you'll, you'll succeed. But if you take steps every day towards your goal, there's a concept in psychology called self-signaling. And basically mm -hmm. what self-signaling is, is that we, we define ourselves based on what we do. Our behavior signals back to us the type of person we are. So Let's just say for you, for example, you have a podcast, like at some point you decide you want to be a podcaster, you know, or you want to do interviews like this. And then mm -hmm. at some point you started doing it. Mm -hmm. And as you started doing it, you started to develop confidence that you can do this better, or you could do more of it. But also you started to realize you started to redefine yourself as someone who's already doing this. Mm -hmm. And so your identity was based on your goal, but it was also based on your behavior. And so as you start acting in a way that reflects who you want to become, you're going to believe it. Um, other people are going to believe it, but also as you start eliminating the, the behaviors, you know, the situations, the people that are keeping you clearly stuck as your former self, that, you know, that's another, that's another powerful thing. And it does take courage to do it. It takes courage to admit to like your friends or your loved ones that this is what you want to do. And this is who you're going to be. Right. Um, but Courage is, courage is kind of the doorway to developing confidence and capability. So you've, you've got to be courageous. You can't really get out of that. It's, it's, that's, that's the essence of upgrading your subconscious. So journaling is a big one. Um, taking daily steps forward, you know, being intentional. intentional. Intentional actions create what's called peak experiences. And peak experiences are just learning experiences. They're, they're moments that help you become more flexible. They're moments that help you to be less rigid in how you see yourself. They, they allow you to reframe your past and see things differently so that you're not just stuck defining yourself by the past. So those yeah, are a few things. Those are, that's very helpful. And, you know, in, it's interesting that you bring up the podcast because we're, and, and the fact that I am a different person than I was 10 years ago, that really plays into this because 10 years ago, uh, you know, real estate development was my career. And at some point in time, when the downturn occurred, it was an epiphany. And I realized, you know, there are many other options in my life that I am passionate about. So I think people have to define their passions. I, when, I, when I've given speeches, I always ask the young audience, if you could do anything you want to do without economic considerations, what would that be? And that's how we begin to define our passions. Well, one of my passions is to share my experiences and my passion for people. 
and their lives and the vicarious learning that we can uh, gain from other people's experiences uh, in Ageless and Timeless and being a person that loves to communicate and loves to be, you know, somewhat philanthropic because this is not a, uh, you know, it's not, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this for my passion. So yes, I, I completely understand uh, how you're describing this. And I'm just hoping that other viewers will vicariously experience this as well. So go back to goals for a moment. So you say that goals are means, not ends. And so let's discuss the goals and how we can go through the routine of setting goals in our lives. What What's your your advice in respect to goal setting? Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to say you're very good at this and I'm glad you're doing it. And I'm glad you got a, you have a lot of passion towards it because it's uh, it's fun to watch you do this. Well, um, coming coming from you, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. No, so much. you're 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 great at this, and I'm great. I'm glad that at some point you decided that this is who you wanted to become, and then you went and pursued it with courage, and Thanks. you're still pursuing it now. And uh, well, there's I hope so I, much, yeah. there's so much more to do, Ben, and to gain that. You know, today, and you've done this because your blog, and when you went from zero to four hundred four hundred thousand viewers, is that what it was? And like four hundred thousand email subscribers, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you know, and I know that today's game in, is the internet and today's game is communication through uh, technology and gaining those viewers and subscribers and followers is really another challenge. It's another process in, in um, you know, setting intentions and, and, and defining your goals. So it, it's, it's not just a matter of sharing information because you're passionate. It's a matter of a technical um, structure that exists today in order to get your message out to, and, and people like you getting their message out to the public at large. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's true. I think it's, uh, I, I, I think that it just is an evidence that context shapes goals, you know, and that uh, uh -huh. this, we wouldn't set these goals if we weren't in this situation, we'd probably be pursuing something totally different. Right. Uh, and that's actually one of the problems actually with things like personality tests. This is that personality tests ignore context. You get a score mm -hmm. and you then overly attach to the label and you assume that that's always true. But when you're in different situations, you're kind of a different person. And so, uh, yeah, one thing I just want to say real quick is, is that personality tests like Myers-Briggs and things like that, they're totally non-scientific and totally destructive. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're just not useful. Uh, they create, they're, they're enjoyable for people because they give people an identity. But the problem is, is that that identity was kind of reactive rather than intentionally chosen based on the future self you want to become. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's based on your current view of yourself or what the test gives you. And then you use your score in that label to set goals rather than setting goals that you genuinely want based on you know, your purpose or your passion, and then using those goals to transform yourself into someone new. So I think you know, first, you yeah, know, Ben, excuse me for interrupting, but that no, is such a, that's such a very important point because we tend as human beings to define ourselves by labels. And when we do that, we're basically putting a frame around a picture that's very static. So how, you know, when you're saying we're not the person we were, we were 10 years ago, that by labeling and framing we are limiting our our expectations of what we can do so i really appreciate it. i read your book at least i read the first few chapters i need to go back and read the rest and i wanted to interview you first because now it'll have a far more compelling reason but i was thinking myers briggs and the rest of the gang are probably not too happy with the the, They're not um, going to like this book. That's for sure. Um, yeah. If you want real quick, before I talk about the goal setting process, I can explain a few of the reasons why labels can be so destructive. Yes, I would love that. Go ahead. Yeah. So labels can be intentionally added upon, you know, you can choose a label, for example, um, the writer, Jeff Goins, he's a you know popular blogger and author. He couldn't get himself to write and he wanted to be a writer for years until he started calling himself a writer. So he stuck, he, he chose identity first and he started, he labeled himself as a writer and that label allowed him then to go forward and begin writing and ultimately he became a successful author and blogger and stuff like that. So that was, that's an example of, of labeling, of choosing a label to support a goal that you want to accomplish. The problem with how most people use labels is, is that they, they use labels to define their goals. So like, let's just say you've, 
taken a personality test and you've gotten some label, then you choose goals to reinforce or to um, support the label. Rather than having labels to support your goals, you choose goals to support your label, which is terrible. But what, what labels do is they, um, so in psychology, there's a concept called selective attention. And basically what it means is, is that we, we see the world through the filter of our identity. We see, what, well, we see what's meaningful to us and we, we're unaware of many things. <laughs> Dan, Sullivan, Dan Sullivan, the founder of Strategic Coach, he has a statement to this. He says, your eyes can only see and your ears can only hear what your brain is looking for. Mm. So what the label does is it gives you something to look for. And then what you do is, is you, you assume that that label is always true. So uh, Ellen Langer, she's a Harvard psychologist. What she has found is that when you overly assume a label, uh, not only will you defend that label, but you become mindless where you, where you don't notice all the times when the label isn't true. So for example, if someone's defined themselves as depressed, they actually won't notice or they'll downplay or ignore all the times when they're actually not depressed. Like there's intermittent times r regularly when they're actually happy or feel good, but they don't notice those because the label creates tunnel vision. It creates... Mm -hmm. And so your label then stops you from seeing, first off, all the times when the label is not true, but the label creates a fixed mindset and it limits what you think you could become. And then you become quite rigid and dogmatic and you assume that the label is who you are and it's always true. When the fact of the matter is, is you're not who you were 10 years ago. If you took the test 10 years ago, you would have gotten a different score. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the research is totally clear on that. The longer the gap between when you take one of these tests, this is one of the reasons why they're not considered scientific is because they're not valid nor consistent. But the longer you go between taking tests, the more different your score will, will be. Uh, mm -hmm. If you take the test in different environments and in different situations, you're going to get different scores. So research mm -hmm. has shown that like, you know, there's research studies that took two different groups and one group got the same test twice, but with the same administrator. And mm -hmm. those, and those scores were pretty similar. And then another, and the other group got the same test twice, but two different administrators. And those two scores were totally different. Um, just because you, you, you answer the questions in a lot of ways, based on the situation, based on your, your emotions of the moment, based on your mood, based on your goals, based on what you're taking the test for. And so the score you get, isn't who you really are. It's based on a lot of different factors. And if you took the test in a different situation or at a different time, you'd actually get a different score. <laughs> and, and so, you know, given that we know that you're not the same person you were 10 years ago, uh, and, and the future version of you is going to be different whether you're thoughtful about it or not. If you start becoming thoughtful about who you want to be, if you start being intentional and clarifying what you want, and then being aggressive and strategic about becoming that person and being consistent with your future self versus your former self, then you're, you're going to go through change. And, and in order to do that, and, and, and by the way, as you build flexibility and confidence, and the, and the concept of psychological flexibility, which is so key, it's, it's key for imagination, but it's also key for dealing with and handling emotions as you go through change. Because as you mentioned, it can be scary. There can be fear involved. There can be self-limiting beliefs or many other things that come to you while you're pursuing something. Mm -hmm. And flexibility means that you hold those things at a distance. Mm -hmm. You don't overly attach with them. You don't ignore them and suppress them, but you, you hold them at a distance as you pursue meaningful goals or live out your values. Um, and you don't overly attach to your current identity and your current views because your current identity and your current views are limited. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully your future self sees things better than your current self does. Mm -hmm. They're going to be in a different situation. If you have a lot of experiences and a lot of learning and a lot of growth, your current, your, you'll realize just like, you know, if you really think about your views of 10 years ago, they were probably different than your views of now. And so your views right now are going to be different from your views in 10 years. Um, and so it's just helpful to not overly defend your identity, um, but to, to be flexible with it. And, mm -hmm. but when it comes to setting goals, you actually do want to start with identity. You want to start with who's the person you genuinely want to become, mm -hmm. because that's the thing that shapes the goals you've set, you know, your future mm -hmm. self, your desired future self, really clarifying what's their situation. What are they up to? Why, why does this matter so much? Like, who do you mm -hmm. really want to be? And what do you really want to be spending your time doing? Mm -hmm. um, and then you need to set, I would argue, a few goals, maybe even just one goal about what's, what's the most practical outcome that would make my future self possible? Is it money? Mm -hmm. Is it a, so when I was a first year graduate student, the person I wanted to become was a professional author. 
I was not that person. I'd mm -hmm. never blogged before. I didn't even know if I could write very well, but mm -hmm. I wanted to become a, a professional author. And so that was my future self. I wanted to be making a living um, writing books and I wanted to be you know, published at one of the traditional publishers. Like, so these are attributes and characteristics of the future self that I was imagining. Well, in order to become that person, I had to actually set a goal. <laughs> uh, and after asking a lot of questions and learning things, I, I decided that I would want to get a six figure book deal, a book contract from one of the major publishers. I said, mm -hmm. if that was true, if I was able to attain a six figure book contract from one of the major publishers, then I could be the future version of me and I would be doing what I want to be doing. So that's something tangible. The brain really likes tangible things mm. that it can focus on and then learn about and become. And so once I had that goal that I was going to get a six figure book deal, then you can begin reverse engineering the process of getting there. So I began asking literary agents, authors, bloggers, the question, how would I get a six figure book deal? What would be involved in, in, in getting that? And I was able to learn that I needed to get a hundred thousand email subscribers and I needed to learn how, and I needed to build a big blog and things like that. And so then I could then go about the process of what I'm calling deliberate practice, but mm -hmm. without a clear goal, you can't actually have a clear process. And there's a, there's a concept in psychology. It's actually a theory. It's called expectancy theory. It's one of the top theories of motivation, but basically what it says is that it's impossible to be motivated first off without a clear and compelling goal. And second off with a clear path of getting there. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you can't have a path if you don't have a goal. And if you don't have a path or a goal, then everything around you is just complex and confusing and you can't really live with intention. And so you can't really be motivated. That's why it's so key to start with identity and then, then come up with a measurable outcome that would get you there and then begin to clarify the process of getting there. Mm -hmm. and, and then the third thing you need to keep building more motivation is you need to start building confidence and you build the confidence by making steps forward and learning and trying and failing and experiencing whatever it is to, as you walk the path from where you are to where you want to go and your path is I, clear. So, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I yeah. think there was, um, sorry to interrupt, but I remember, no, no I remember in um, one of my first careers of, about a hundred years ago, I was a teacher and I remember reading an educational psychologist from uh, I think Harvard named uh, Bruner and one Jerome of Jerome Bruner. Yeah. Jerome Bruner. And what he says is you learn by doing and, and imitation is another form of learning by doing because if you watch the experts and the role models for you, I'm sure you did this as well. A hundred percent. Right. And so then you, that's, that's how attention. That's play. selective attention. You're paying attention to the people doing what you want to be doing. Right. And, and then you can start to mimic. Yeah, that's exactly. brilliant. It's totally brilliant. It's so true. You've got to know what you want, though, in order to actually start looking for the people who are doing it, right? Right. But if you, let's just use fitness as an example. If you really think about yourself in a certain physique or in a certain form of fitness, once you actually just think about it and conceptualize something, then you can start observing people who are where you want to be. And you can start to imagine yourself in that place. One of the big things to solidify identi identity, to be honest with you, and to increase commitment is to begin investing money into your mm. future identity. Like this is a big one. If you start, in, so for example, you as a podcaster, at some point you had to start investing cash into right. that goal. You bought like a podcast microphone. Uh, you bought education products, potentially learning how to do it or, you know, mentor. Once you start investing money into your goals and into your future mm -hmm. identity, then you, then you start to increase your commitment to it. There's a concept right. called the endowment effect um, and even sunk cost bias. But basically the idea is, is that commitment follows investment. And, and so once you start investing in something, um, you start really wanting it more and you start feeling a sense that you need to do it because you've got some ownership and you feel like you need to like make good on the investment. Exactly. Um, ROI, we call it business. <laughs> yeah. So, investment. I mean, it's strategic, it's genius. I mean, you know, I spent quite a few years in my PhD program studying the differences between wannabe entrepreneurs and real entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And one of the big differences is that real entrepreneurs started investing money into their goals. And as a result, it shifted their identity so that they started actually taking action and taking risks because they were invested mm -hmm. and their identity shifted where they began to realize they were an entrepreneur and they began putting themselves in a state where they were moving forward. Whereas the wannabes were pretty non-invested. Um, and so if you start investing money in your goals, like there's a great story that Zig Ziglar used to tell about, um, a guy named, um, I think it was, 
something Hartman, Paul Hartman or something like that. Um, mm. But it was this 450 pound guy, totally overweight, but he had like a, a peak, ex- a peak experience where he realized he wanted to change his life. Uh, it was actually at a Zig Ziglar conference. <laughs> and so mm. that's why Zig tells the story mm. so much. But one of the <laughs> things, one of the things that, uh, oh, it was Tom Hartman, the story of Tom Hartman. But one of the things he did, which was genius, is that when he left the conference and he committed to the idea that he was going to get healthy, he went to a clothing store and he bought two suits, two custom mm. suits for a skinny person. Mm-hmm. And when the, when the person who was selling the suits asked who the suits were for, Tom mm. said they're for me. <laughs> and these are like skinny suits. And this is a 450 pound man. The clerk, <laughs> I think the clerk was laughing at him, but that was him investing in his future identity. Mm-hmm. And he kept, you know, as I was describing about journaling, he was visualizing his future self, writing about it, talking about it, telling people this is what he was going to do and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, changing his environment so that he was eating healthier and being a different person. Mm-hmm. And at some point or another, he had the, the identity shift where he no longer identified as a, as a heavyweight man, like as an overweight man, he stopped identifying with his former self and he, he began to fully identify with his future self. And that became his new identity and his new reality and his behavior followed. And a year, year and a half later, he was like 180 or 190 pounds less. And so you can be very strategic about this. I mean, even in the book, I tell the story of a guy named Ken Har- Arlen, um, who's someone I met uh, at Genius Network. And Ken in college was a, like a, a pervasive smoker. Like he couldn't, he got addicted to smoking. This was like back in like the seventies. Um, and when he got a job, he got a job as like an, uh, like an actuary or something like that. And like, uh, like in a hospital or I, I forget what it's called, but he was, he was like a worker in a hospital and he had mm-hmm. moved States. He got a job and he moved States and in the hospital, there was a smoking lounge. And on his first day, he went into the smoking lounge on a break and someone offered him a cigarette and asked him, you know, if he wanted to smoke And what Ken said is no, thanks. Don't smoke. Never have, never will. <laughs> and honestly, like from that moment forward, he never smoked again. Cause he, he like literally changed his identity in mm-hmm. the new situation, in the new environment. And he now had an identity as a non-smoker. Mm-hmm. And he, in that he created a mantra that he would repeat because repetition is also a, a very good tool for learning The more you repeat something or the more you do, the more you acquire the skills that you want. So I, I, I read the one, um, person who was trying to lose a lot of weight and they put a storyboard on their refrigerator and in that on the storyboard were pictures of them when they were much you know skinnier skinnier or of other people who whose bodies they emulated and you know every time they opened that refrigerator <laughs> they had to look at that those pictures well pictures are worth a thousand words and so they reinforce your behavior well and in our identity is shaped through the stories we tell mm-hmm. and so you know, what story are you telling about yourself? Is it the same mm-hmm. story you've been telling for years? And is the story mm-hmm. based on your past or is it based on your future? And by right. the way, in case you didn't know, you can change the story of your past. You don't mm-hmm. have to keep seeing your former experiences the same way mm-hmm. that you do now. In fact, if you grow and evolve as a person, you are, your memories will change. Mm-hmm. And, and memories, particularly, particularly yeah. not being a victim. That, that's what I That's think big. Is, it's essential. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with traumatic memories or with painful experiences or things that went wrong for you, um, you can get to the point where you frame the experiences as these things happened for me, not to me. These things were a benefit. These things mm-hmm. helped me become the person I'm today. These things taught me things that are going to change my future. Mm-hmm. Um, you get to shape the lens of your former experiences and the more developed you become and the more conscious you are about choosing your own identity and about creating your own future, the more you have to reshape the narrative of your past. Um, you can't keep being the victim uh, and, and you have to take ownership of the former story as well. And, and you, you can also get new context and new perspective. So there, there's the big idea that context shapes the content. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story just to prove this. So my, my, uh, my mother-in-law was recently at the gym and there was a really heavy, like overweight girl working out at the gym, like very overweight. And she was wearing tight fitted clothing. Mm. Um, and like, everyone was kind of like, 
judging her and looking at her and like thinking like this is awkward like why is she wearing such revealing clothing like this is a very overweight woman Mm -hmm. and my mother-in-law went and started talking to her and she found out that this woman had already lost 150 pounds wow and so here's my question for you when you learn that this woman has lost 150 pounds does that change how you see her Mm. well it puts in context the fact that she's on a on a on a journey of goal setting and she's already accomplished 150 pounds of her goal setting and she's living her uh her vision of who she is in the future in the present so she's wearing the clothes that she's going to wear when her body is where she wants it to be but if but if you learn that this woman lost 150 pounds does that does that information change how you see her yes of course it makes her um you know an an accomplished woman you're now like proud of this woman and you're amazed by her rather than being repulsed by her and and so that's an example of how context shapes content Mm -hmm. it's the woman doesn't matter the context is what matters and -hmm. that's true about your past that's true about your memories when you change the context you change the meaning of the content and Mm -hmm. you stop you stop having to believe that these things that happened to you were negative they actually could be viewed from a different context and a different perspective as very positive. Mm. And you can actually change how you feel about them. You can change the emotion of the memory. You can even change the story of the memory mm. by getting more information, more context, more perspective. Mm. And then your former narrative can be something that was positive and something that mm-hmm. was happening for you. And you're the shaper of that story. You don't have to be defined by some version of it that's limited. Um, and so, yeah, you need to shape both the narrative of your of of your past and your future, and, um, and well, then the, begin uh, acting from the from the perspective of the future. Yeah, and going back to the victim issue, you know, when when we uh, all experience adversity, challenge, and adversity, and it, I think truly the the greatest um, success stories in life are the people who have learned from their failures and who are have taken adversity and 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 morphed that into opportunity. And an opportunity meaning a chance to grow and learn, and that the past doesn't therefore define us if it's had adversity, because it really is the, our opportunity to learn and grow for the future. So, would would you agree with that concept? Yeah, a hundred percent. Here, here's where you want the past to be. If you if you're still avoiding the past and thinking about it and talking about it because of traumatic or painful experiences, Mm -hmm. what this means is is that the past is still heavily emotional for you. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's dictating and driving your decision. Mm -hmm. And it's blocking you. Yeah. Well, so that this is why they say that trauma is one of the main trauma creates what's called a frozen personality. Trauma creates a personality where you're stuck in the past and it limits what you pursue because you're avoiding dealing with hard emotions hard things you create a fixed mindset and your your past is dictating your future versus Mm -hmm. your future dictating your present um and so yeah i mean traumatic experiences are huge but what you want to do is is once you just face it and you think about it you talk about this is why journaling is a a great exercise is because you can journal about your experiences and you can think about them in a safe place and you can Yeah, you'll feel some stuff and you need to feel that stuff and you need to reframe it. You need to think about how could I see this differently? And maybe that might involve you having conversations with various people, Um, but you neutralize the emotions of it by, by facing it. I mean, if you do something enough, it loses its novelty and it becomes emotionless. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like for me, for example, when I was growing up, my parents got divorced and um, my father became quite a heavy drug addict and for a long time, I blamed my father. I was the victim of, of, you know, that situation. And I felt like he, he led me to a lot of painful experiences. Well, since then, one thing to know is, is that he's overcome his addictions and he even spent a lot of time as a, as a addiction recovery, like support group person. But the other thing we've developed an amazing relationship and I've spent the time asking him his perspective of those experiences. When, when I was a teenager and he was caught in his negative cycle, I, I wanted to know what led him to that. And I'd never done that when I was a teenager, but mm. I got more context because I, I got to understand him and therefore I could develop more compassion and empathy towards mm. him and, and understanding. And so because I was willing to have those conversations and not you know, rather than just blaming those experiences and being defined by them, what happened is, is that the past became information, not emotion. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's how you want your past to be. If your past is information, mm. because you've gone through rich experiences, you've gone through challenging, hard experiences, those experiences, if they're information, they're, they're, they're knowledge you can use, just like a book. A book is information. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if your past is still emotion, then you're being used by it. You're being pushed a certain way. But if you, if you face it, if you think about it, if you get more perspective, more context, then your past can be information you can use. And it can be something that's very beneficial, very helpful, because you've got some very potent, very powerful information that you can use to make better decisions or to avoid pain in the future. So the past can be very useful, very positive, very powerful in helping Mm. you have a better future if it's information that you can use rather than emotion that's driving you to live a limiting life. Mm. You, You said something in your blog today which I was reading when I first woke up this morning. <laughs> now you know what my routine was that um, I always, you say, don't go to your phone, but I learned from my phone apps. Because, sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, it sounds like you're studying positive things. Well, that's true. That, that's true. Hey, hey, Ben, give me one second. My doorbell is ringing. I'm so sorry. But you're fine. Let me, let me ask you a question before I run to the door so that you've been thinking about it. In today's corporate world, because I'm a corporate executive by background, um, the word disruption has become the big buzzword. So as soon as I come back in one minute, I want to talk to you and have you comment on this this concept of disruption and how it plays to what we've been talking about. So, um, okay, here we go. So disruption, what, what does it mean to you and um, how do we navigate the world today with a culture of experimentation, and this isn't just in the corporate world. This is our personal lives as well. So uh, it seems like technology and the, the speed at which change is occurring uh, is causing many corporate executives and individuals to question how they navigate life with um, the expertise that is the context, <laughs> using your term, of what we are uh, experiencing today. So could you comment on that for a moment and what your thoughts are? Yeah, I have a few quick thoughts. One is that, so there's a concept I talk about in the book called strategic ignorance. Um, And basically it's the idea that most of the information or most of the things that are happening in the world, you could and should just be ignorant of because they they will derail you. and, And, you know, so as an example, Peter Diamandis, uh, he's a famous futurist. He talks about how mm. he doesn't watch the news anymore because it's just, it doesn't support him. It doesn't help him. Like right. he's still very well informed because he has to like know what's going on in current events and things like that. So like he's, but he's strategically ignorant of a lot of things because he just knows that when it comes into his brain, it's not helpful. Like mm-hmm. it, it literally derails him. Um, and so like you can, I think that when you make decisions about who you want to be and the life you want to live, I think that it's key to cut off a lot of information sources and a lot of options. Uh, there's a good book called The Paradox of Choice. Mm. And it talks about how when you have choice overload, you end up not making any decisions. You cre- it, it creates what's called decision fatigue. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think the first thing that came to my mind when you were talking about disruption is, is that there's a lot of things going on in the world, yes, and that a lot of really brilliant and amazing things and a lot of confusing things. And I think that if you are overly absorbed in all of it, um, rather than absorbed in like the goals that you're pursuing and the meaning you're pursuing and the cause and, and, and the few things that you can focus on as a human being, um, then you're going to be paralysis by analysis. You're going to be overwhelmed by everything that's happening and you're not going to, you're not going to be able to move forward with purpose. And so I think mm-hmm. that a lot of what's going on is irrelevant to you and your goals and doesn't mean you shouldn't be informed because I think we should mm-hmm. always be constantly learning. Um, but a lot of things are just honestly not relevant and not useful and not helpful to you. And so mm-hmm. there's many things that I just don't need to be aware of. Frankly, mm-hmm. if I want to move forward in a meaningful way and live a useful, meaningful life and be a father of five kids and to like actually live a life, there's a lot of things that I just don't need to know about. Mm-hmm. Um, so is you, are you calling that selective information then? That we, uh, I'm just calling it selective ignorance. Selective ignorance. That's or strategic. Actually, it's called strategic ignorance. Strategic, yeah. Um, so I think that that's, that's a part of shaping your environment so that you can actually focus on what you want to do and what you want to be in and live a life. But still, it doesn't mean you want to cut everything off. I mean, you still want to be informed and learn, but you need to be, you got to create a better filter and maybe a better system at gaining the right information um, and being exposed to the right things. So I think that that's part of it. There's a lot of hype in the world as far as disruption. And I think that when it comes down to it, we're still dealing with the same human problems. 
Um, mm. But I love, there's a part of me that really loves all this as well. Cause I love, I love the innovative nature of it. Like I love, mm-hmm. for example, I love the movie Interstellar, which is, a, you know, the Christopher Nolan movie about going to space. Mm-hmm. There's a big side of me. I, I love the idea that we went to the moon, for example. And I love the idea of humans striving to evolve and grow and develop and, and do and do new things and disrupt former ways of seeing and being and living. And so there's, I think there's a really positive aspect of all this. And I think that, um, you know, being innovative, being creative, taking risks, trying big things, trying moonshots, having vision, having purpose, having goals, mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, throwing off old ways uh, is really powerful. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I think, I, I, yeah. I think Steve Jobs was, Steve Jobs was probably the consummate disruptor um, disruptor in that regard. I think he was great I loved Steve Jobs for that and uh, I think that there was a lot about what he's did that's really transformed and improved our lives and I think mm-hmm. that that's that's key is having a purpose and a goal and striving to disrupt a broken system uh, and I think that that's where you can get a lot of purpose is doing something that helps other people or improves humanity or I think it's really powerful to have a purpose and mm-hmm. and to disrupt or change the status quo I think it's great yeah, Amazon is another great example of what Jeff Bezos has done, you know, starting out with the limited, limiting goal at, at the beginning of being in the publishing business, and then look where they are today and how the culture of experimentation has played its role in the development of this, uh, this amazing company. And, and, and the other thing about, you know, Amazon and Apple as well, but Amazon particularly, is the customer, the attention to the customer, the customer care part of that, that to me seems like it, it plays right into your philosophy um, and about the future and being who you want to be now in the present, you know, project into what your goals are for the future. So I started to say, and I, I left the subject for a moment, but um, this morning I was reading your blog and we were, you were talking about entrepreneurship and I want to focus on that just for a moment. And you gave a quote about, um, you said it was an unknown author, but um, the, the, can you repeat that quote that um, it, was so, it was so prescient, I loved it, but if you could just repeat that for a moment, do you remember what you said? I mean, was the uh, was the quote at the beginning of the article? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me read it. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read it real quick. Let me see. Oh, okay. I'm glad you have it right with you. Well, I'll just, I'm just opening the link. So it says entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't, so that you right. can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. I love. I love that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think- honestly think that that's true of any goal. Like right, right now, just as an example, like I'm striving to launch this book, you know, right. and I'm doing things that I wouldn't normally do. Again, the goal shapes the process. When you have a right. major, massive, innovative, or transformative goal, disruptive goal that disrupts your life, and if you commit to it, and if you go through this process that I'm just calling deliberate practice, but it's it's really the process of becoming who you want to be intentionally mm-hmm. and going through the rigors of learning and growth. Mm -hmm. Um, when you do something specific and big enough for a few years, it transforms everything about your life and puts you in a new trajectory, a new position, a new socioeconomic status. I mean, um, it upgrades your subconscious so that your new normal is you being successful and you being this new identity and this new environment and situation. And so Mm -hmm. I just think being intentional about anything, but entrepreneurship just old, you know, just happens to be a powerful vehicle for making positive change in yourself and in the world. And it's very purposeful. It's very transformative. And it can put your life on a radically different situation so that you're free. You know, you have freedom to, uh, you know, have the money, the time, the relationships and, and, uh, and the purpose that other people just don't have who don't take those leaps. So, so what do you think, because entrepreneurship is obviously, you know, known as the risk takers of our world. And, um, you know, people who will think outside the box and take leaps of faith and um, risk it all. It's it's an identity. All the research in the world talks about how entrepreneurship is an identity that's that's chosen and a story that's selected. The same is true of becoming a professional athlete or Mm -hmm. a performer of some sort. At some point, you start to tell yourself that this is who you are and you start, again, taking making those investments in Mm -hmm. your future self and your identity changes. And so pursuing or achieving any goal involves risk. And mm-hmm. so 
you can become an entrepreneur. It's not like you're born. Yeah. Some people think that, you know, you're born that way. And yeah, some people maybe have a little bit of a bent, but you can, you can select an identity and you can reinforce that identity through behavior. And eventually your subconscious catches up and it becomes how you see yourself and how you act. It becomes your habits. It becomes your character, becomes your personality. And so if you want to become an entrepreneur, you can do it. You just have to start acting like one and you've got to have a reason to do it. Um, and so uh, I, for me, more than anything, it's a story. It's a narrative and it's an identity. And the research backed me up on that. <laughs> so how do you, why do you feel so many startups fail then? It, it, 66%, I think, is the percentage of failures in uh, the first five, <clears throat> five years. So, you know, technically speaking, a startup is going to be run visioned by an entrepreneur so why is it that there is not a better success rate because it's we're, we're, we're talking about a single instance you know your if your first company fails does that mean you should quit like no. if, if 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 you failed the first time you tried to play golf or to swim does that mean you're not good at it right uh, and so yeah i mean what what i call that is learning you know, selecting better goals, doing better research, maybe building a better team. I mean, becoming an entrepreneur is not easy. It takes a lot of work and education and also better, better situations and goals. And there's a lot involved. And if you fail the first time or few, don't turn that into a trauma. You know, there's a really good goal. I mean, a really good quote from uh, Robert Rawl. He said, we're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to lesser goals. So the idea mm. is we're kept from our goal, not by the obstacles or the failures, mm. but because at some point we choose a clear path to some lesser goal. Mm. We just, we, 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 we internalize the failure. It turns into a trauma. We stop having imagination. We stop having confidence and courage, and we just choose something easier and we limit our identity. And we just say, I'm just going to take an easier path. I, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And so so we, you know, that's, we, that's, the op, that's the opposite of learning, by the way, that's, that, yeah. that's, essentially, that's, that's essentially giving up in the name of being realistic because you're not committed and because right. you've, you've internalized a painful experience and turned it into a trauma and into a narrative that you can't do it. Yeah. We set, we settle for less, which is mediocrity. So Ben, I just looked at my watch and I can't believe yep, how yep. fast the time went by and I know it was a blast. I loved being with you. I love being with you too. And I, I absolutely want to have you come back with well, so much more that I want to discuss with you, but yep. we're going to be looking for your book. Let's launch. do another. Yes, we'll do that. And I do want to, I know you've offered something very generous to our viewers and I wanted you to take a moment. Uh, your assistant suggested the mastery class, but I'm leaving this up to you to, to offer what you think will incite our viewers to be more um, aware of what your teachings are and, and to participate more actively and to actually think about their future selves by being in the present with you. So if you could give us like one minute to- Yeah, I'll be very brief. I'll be very yeah. brief. So if you pre-order or order personality isn't permanent, if you buy the book in any format, you know, Kindle, Amazon, et cetera, however you want to buy it. And then you go, you know, to my website, you can, you know, and you submit your receipt of sorts, you can get a free online course of, you know, that goes deeper into the book, teaches, the oh. ideas, but, but also you can get a free blogging course that uh, people have paid thousands of dollars to learn from. It was a full day presentation I gave at Genius Network and it teaches all the strategies and things like that, that allowed me to get 400,000 email subscribers. You can get those things. Oh, I I you can get those things for that. free by pre-ordering the book. Um, and if, if, uh, if for some reason you're confused on that, just email uh, Ben at BenjaminHardy.com with your receipt and we will send you access to both of those courses. So Okay, that's, that's what I'm going to put on my website. Um, under I have a, an icon called Michelle Recommends on my website, which is DagelessAndTimeless.com if you want to look at that. And um, <clears throat> in on the Michelle recommends under your bio, we'll put the offer and we will add that email. So let me have you repeat that real quickly so I can write that down. So it's Ben at BenjaminHardy.com. Oh, that's easy. Okay. And do you offer consultations to people for life? No. Okay. You're just, you're keeping this to the book and the publishing. Yes. 
Okay, perfect. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. And uh, we will be uh, airing your podcast in a couple of weeks, but we'll also wait till your book publishing date, which is June 16th or thereabouts. And yep. uh, we'll, we'll uh, air it again. So people who missed it the first time could see it again. So Ben, have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us today. They've been extraordinary and I think cha life-changing, game-changing. Hopefully our viewers will agree and, and they will be uh, taking you up on your offer. Please do. Buy Personalities and Permanent. It will change your life. And uh, thank you all very much. And I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you, Ben. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It was great to be with you. Thank you. My love for you is immeasurable. My respect for you. Your ageless, timeless, lace and fineness, your beauty.